anyway. But to go down and, and actually be able to perform and do stuff would be would be stellar. Alrighty, well, uh, we're live. We're on. This is it. Right, right. So Ron and I were just. Uh, well, anyway, sorry, it's Ron. Everybody, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we're just oh, talking about God. trying to get Ron Ron to Australia. We're gonna we're gonna yes. do a, a go a GoFundMe go fund Ron to to get him here uh, so we can go we see. Need, him. We need a, we need a promoter and a GoFundMe. Let's That's all we need. Let's go. Like stat. Let's, so if let's anybody, fund this who, thing and let's get him here. Get my ass down there. All right, Ron. Uh, usually I do introductions. Yeah. Uh, you can do an introduction, but I I'm I'm filled with questions. You so can. I mean, you can you can roll. I mean, if you want to, you know, bring me on and you know uh, and tell your audience about me, or if you want me to dive in and do it. Yeah, uh, how, about, how, about, how about you give it a go and then I'll ask the questions that I got in the uh, in the tube. That so, sounds awesome. All right, how, all right. How, how about it? Yeah, all right. Well, I'm Ron Fitzgerald. I'm uh, known as the master of the dark realm, which means uh, I'm an actor and a gothic illusionist and I create dark, sticky fun for you guys. You're welcome. And uh, you can find me all over social media and stuff like that if you want to see what I'm doing. The YouTube channel is probably a, a great place to start. And um, that's under my name, Ron Fitzgerald. Uh, you can see all the stuff there. We'll get into where all you can find me online and stuff. But, yeah, I'll, but I'll link it anyway. What I do. Um, I started as a gothic illusionist many, many, many years as a kid, and and I was doing like normal magic at first, you know, birds, bunnies, formal wear, that kind of crap. Yeah. And then, uh, and then I it got to where it was no longer interesting to me or my contemporaries. It was a nice family show, but I was tired of magic as just polite entertainment. So. I took all the things that I always loved as a kid because I was a, I was a weird kid, obviously, to be into magic in the first place. But then I like comic books and horror films and haunted houses and Halloween, and I just love all the dark, sticky fun is what I call it. Yeah. So I yeah. used the show with that. And once the show got like that, then, of course, my persona all changed. I mean, because it's like, you know, back at that point, it's like, you know, you look like a, you look like a young Luke Skywalker in formal wear, you, you know, and then – from there, it, it goes, and then uh, my hair got really long. It was really blonde. It was all blown out, like white blonde, like Andy Warhol kind of blonde. <laughs> and then I shaved it all off in this look, and it went, you know, a little harder. But once I had this look, then people started coming to me and saying, hey, would you like to be in my horror film? Because I had built this, mm, this yeah. show, a, a gothic illusion show, where I'm eating razor blades and cutting off people's heads and – you know, cremating them live in coffins on stage and stuff. You know, it is not a normal illusion show. It it is it is fun, but it is it it also has there's a you know a dark tinge to it. You know, it's it's like gothic horror and illusion, and that's what got me invited into uh, horror films. I've been acting in horror films for like indie horror films for the last you know twenty years or so, and and that's kind of the genesis of how it all came around. And then I made a movie called Dark realm which is on amazon and, and it's on amazon in the u.s and the uk and you can find it in, in uh, other places around the globe as well and many other amazon platforms and that is a combination of uh my life it's like 65 percent, i would say 70 percent gothic illusion show it's it's my show shot in a theater on a live stage nice setting you get the best seat in the house but it's live performance mixed with art house horror so you get you get a horror narrative it goes in and weaves through and, and around and packages the stage show. There's nothing else like it. It's loosely inspired by um, The Wizard of Gore by Herschel Gordon Lewis from like 1970 or 71. Yeah. It's, a, it's an old, yeah. super old school gore film, but it's about this like killer magician. So it, it, it's loosely based on that and it gets kind of trippy. And it's the trippy parts that I kind of seized on for Dark Realm. So anyway, so that's what makes me the master of the Dark Realm and that's kind of the genesis of, of, of going from where I started as a kid with magic into acting and everything. Because when I studied, I studied theater and acting and everything in, in college, yeah. but I never, I, I, I did that strictly for the stage to make the stage show better and to put more production value into me and in the show. And, and when, when the persona became so strong that people wanted me for the horror mm -hmm. films, it was good because I actually had, some acting background and some training. Yeah. So when I dove in and the first time I was on a set, I was like, oh, hell yeah, I love this. And the same people that will come and see me in a horror film are the same people that will love my dark illusion show. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I agree. So I saw you it's a long explanation, but that's the explanation. <laughs> and uh, that's, the, uh, that's the podcast, everyone. Thank you for now. <laughs> and that's it. Good that's night, it, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. We're done. Um, I even saw you're, uh, you're in a comic as well, a comic book. 
uh, Haunting Tales of Bachelor's Grove, put out by Silver Phoenix Entertainment. Yeah. And uh, there's there's two people that are based on real people, real personas. Myself and the awesome and lovely uh, Kudrosha Ona, who's the queen, known as the queen of the paranormal. She got the master of the dark realm and the queen of the paranormal. Did I both? And we are, it's perfect. And and she's a, a gorgeous blonde and very wonderful and has a great persona herself. And she acts in a lot of films as well. So we wound up being like the, the humans personified in the uh, the, the uh, Haunting Tales of Gothic, or, or Haunting Tales of Bachelor's Grove comic book. And Bachelor's Grove is an actual cemetery That's right. uh, kind of in the south of Chicago, where, where I'm at. And the, uh, it's one of the most haunted cemeteries in the U.S., yeah. So we figured yeah. that would be a good place to kind of center all these creepy stories around. And then it's kind of like creep show. It's kind of an anthology of those stories. And then, and then control shows character and, and myself in the, in the comic book form, we kind of lead you through those stories and we're in those stories. So oh, it's really yeah, fun. Yeah. We, we, we're into, we're into like the second, third issue of a six issue limited run. Yeah. And we're seeing how it goes from there. But but if you've seen any of it, the, the art's really great. Oh, and they're fantastic. changing up artists. Every every different comic book has a different artist. Um, and it's uh, kind of the, our evil genius over there at, at uh, Silver Phoenix Entertainment is uh, Charles D. Moissant. And Charles is the producer of the comic. And then our writer is uh, my awesome friend, Brian K. Morris. And Brian did all the writing for all the, the great stories. And it was fun because they gave me some editorial rights so I could make the character sound more like me. Yeah, it's uh, it's yeah. it's great. I only I only caught like snippets of it. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to get it. I'm a I'm a comic book fan. Uh, Are you a comic book? Guy? Yeah, love there comic you go. Books. Cheers to that because yeah. I love comics. Yeah, it's. I uh, mean, that was one of the things that inspired the stage show in the first place. So to come around and actually get to be in comics yeah. and in horror films, the things that inspired the show in the first place is kind of a dream come true. It, it I never expected that to be part of the career in the beginning i hadn't you know i yeah. i guess i hadn't thought it out that far i i, I thought that the, the plan was well you get a cool show and you customize it you know so it's more personal and then uh once you've got something different then you put it on tv and you crank out television specials and you go on tour and i thought that was going to be the model but <laughs> it turned out to be a little different when it went the other way huh went the other way um let's start uh let's start from the beginning all right so i was watching your shows and i was watching those the early ones um mm -hmm. i think there was a, a a thing on youtube where it was like a bit of a, a montage from like start to not finished but you know it was gone to the, yeah. the the lifespan like what got mm -hmm. you into magic like where was the where's the defining thing obviously what was it something you were into is like a like a little a young fella or was it uh um, yeah. oh yeah i was yes yeah go, go ahead yeah. So uh, yeah, and then and then when did you adapt this uh, like this sort of spooky aspect to it? Mm -hmm. Well, I started when I was eight years old. I got a magic kit as a gift. Yeah. And yeah, and and my mom got it for me. I mean, so you know, uh, blame her. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> she, <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but she's awesome, and I and I I have asked her since then. I'm like, was there something particular about you know what I was doing or what I was into when I was eight? Because I don't really remember that much other yeah. than I was into magic and stuff. And I guess because I had seen you know magic on television and things like that, so she knew I would like that, you know. And I was the artsy her artsy weird kid, yeah. So I got the magic kit. And I just, for some reason, I loved it. And I know, I mean, you, you may have had one. I know so many people, and there's probably people out there listening to us, watching us now. Yeah. Some of you guys had a magic set, a magic kit when you were a kid. And for some reason, I stuck with it. And I thought, but I didn't have this language then, but I thought, uh, well, that's a, a valid vehicle of expression. I can express things and do artsy, weird stuff with that. I'll hang, I'll keep doing that. Yeah. You know, whereas yeah. most people, would have gone into something more i guess you know that had you know uh, more venues like like you know acting in theater and and you know uh, you know acting in, in plays or even in television movies and things like that or, or or dance or or music something like that yeah but instead i was i was into magic and, and for some reason it stuck with me I, it, it stuck and i just ran with it because i just was such a magic geek as a kid. But I liked all that geeky stuff like you were talking about. I love comic books. I love horror movies. I loved Halloween and haunted attractions, haunted houses and things. Yeah. 
So I went yeah. with all that shit. I just like, you know, right out of the gate, I just kind of went. But for a long time, I was classically trained, what they call classic magic. It was, you know, bunnies and birds and tuxedos mm. and glitter and, you know, all that smiling, happy, dancing, flight entertainment crap. And after a while, I had a nice, polished family show. But one of my friends, she took me aside, and she's like, you're way more interesting offstage than on. And at that point, it hit me that I need to take all the cool, weird shit that I'm into and put it in the show. Because it was also the show I wanted to see that nobody else was doing. I mean, and there's been some other creepy guys that I've discovered and that have come along you know, since then, but I, when I started that, I, you know, I was probably, you know, around you know college age, like 20 or so or something like that. And that's when I finally said, all right, I'm, I I want to do my own thing with this. And I made a hard left turn, right turn with it. Mm. And I just, you know, it, it became, you know, again, it was before that, I had the language for it at that point, it was dark, sticky fun, you know, because it was all the, the dark and fun stuff. But it was also, it was a thing where I would perform the illusions and they would be kind of like a, a vignette almost and they would be lots of like gothic music or alternative music and it would be dark and mysterious and, you know, and sexy because you're, you're out there with all these, you know, hot uh, other, the, the female performers you're out there with and stuff like that, you know, to sex it up and make it intriguing. And, and I guess that, that goes back into kind of like the stereotypical, you know, archetype of, of magic and illusion as well. But I really consider them more, more, more intricate, more, more, more of a co-performer than simply just your assistant. You know, mm. it's it, it's a more theatrical kind of uh, feel to it. Even though I am anchoring the show, I'm hosting the show. Um, but that was the interesting thing about it is like it, it's more like a horror host hosting a horror movie that's dark. But when they step out and they, you know, and you've got the host of the show, which I'm kind of a, the host for my own show then, and then. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm being more myself and I'm cracking, you know, uh, weird jokes and uh, making a little bit of fun of the stuff. You got you to gotta love it to make fun of it proper. So uh, it, it gives it a humor and darkness, which is kind of like a horror host kind of thing, you know? Yeah, you definitely get that sort of vibe from it. It's not just a, like a, a, aside from like the, the you know, the dark and, sort of like creepy side to it it's it's more of a show it's more more of like this encompassing like everybody's involved uh you know what i mean and everybody's playing their part and they're really driving a it's more of a like a broadway type show with magic rather than a magic show with with broadway you. you know yeah, what i mean it, it is and if you can look at dark realm you'll see that that's really what what i'm going for is is more of a a theatrical experience because there's a lot of great close up and everything. There's lots of cards, lots of coins. Actually, there, there's great people doing card work and, and close up and stuff. But I, I'm I'm so inundated and I've seen so much card magic in my lifetime. You know, being in the magic industry, that unless it's really different or really good or a, a really good performer with it, is that most of the time it's really good magic. But I don't find it very entertaining because of the way it's presented. So about 10 seconds into another card effect, my eyes are glazing up. Yeah. It, it's got to be something different or have a hook to it. That, that to, so I find it fun or weird or different somehow. So it stands out. Because otherwise there's a lot of it. But but uh, that was never what I specialized in. I like being on stage and I like bigger, more theatrical things. Which is why I studied, you know, television production and theater and acting uh, so I could make that show bigger. But uh, Before I ever thought I'd use it as a, as, you know, just to act as a, as a legitimate actor in, in film, you know, I, I was using it for the stage show to make it more theatrical, to make it, to give it more, more power and punch and, and uh, production value, you know? Yeah. It's uh, like I said, it's, it's, it's definitely a show on its own. Um, you know what I mean? Well, I, thank you. I, of, did you enjoy what you were finding? On yeah. The, was, you did. You brought me on. So. Like it, it is, it is cool stuff. Like it's, it's, yeah. it's thank weird you. and bizarre, but kind of like, fun yes. and exciting at the same time you know what i mean it's like a, a, well that's the thing you gotta sell it fun it, it is fun and, and that's where the you know it's dark but it's also fun and that's that's where that comes from you gotta have a there's got i just like you know it, it's got to have a certain enthusiasm i guess for that weirdness you know yeah. so yeah yeah that's yeah that comes from but thank you I'm, I'm glad you enjoy it and um 
you know, for what it is. So that that's cool. Thank you. No worries. No worries at all. Um, so yeah. it, your career starts off. You're, you're doing magic since eight, eight years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And then you, and you start to, to, to really just form it yourself. Where, where do you find that you're like, holy fuck, this is a, this is it. This is like, this is my job. Because obviously at that age, when you're really young, there's like, Mm-hmm. external pressures in a sense that like get a get a real job or you know what i mean that those oh those... Yeah, well my 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 dad was not down with show business he he tried to dissuade me many times from just because the only thing he knew about show business was it's hard yeah and i'm like i, I get that you have to be entrepreneurial and you have to do a lot of that yourself and you have to do branding and all that stuff that you know we all know about now but, you know, when you're young and you don't know it, and this was pre-internet, so it made it harder to research that. You had to go network and find people and find this shit to get it, to, to learn it and, and do it. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I asked myself that a lot, uh, what made me stick with it. But honestly, I just felt like I was made to do it. I just feel like what I'm doing, I am, I am built because of the stuff that I'm kind of, I don't, I don't know where the predisposition for the love of, the weird and you know horror and comics and Halloween and and spooky weird stuff and I just I just seem to you know naturally gravitate towards that and then as well as magic so fusing it all together it seemed like a, a natural thing for me and you know you get you know down the road and you stop and you ask yourself you know when especially when it gets tough because it is you know anybody who's, you know, forming their own show business career, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a tough gig. And, and it's gotta be one of those things you have, that it's a labor of love. Otherwise you're out, you're, you're done. And you stop and you ask yourself at some point, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it, it, this is really tough. I could do something else, you know, that, that would be just basically to subsist on that you would be make it would be, be more in the interest of making money and making your life easier and simpler rather than doing the thing that you love, which is many times hard to do, especially in the beginning before you're established. So, uh, so I asked myself that question and it's just like, you know what, what the hell else would you do? You know, if I did anything else, you know, I might make some quicker money, uh, but it would have been miserable. And I didn't want to make that trade. You know, a lot of people do, people do it all the time and they hate doing it. And I don't know, I don't know what it was about me. I guess I was just stubborn enough where I just said, you know, fuck it. I'm I'm just going to get going. I'm in and I'm good. I'm not built for anything else. I'm not really, you know, I'm like, I'm built for this. And I felt like that. It was my, you know, my, my calling to do it. So I, I just, it's like anything else, you know, if you love something when you, when you're in it and even when it gets tough, you're just like, screw it, let's go. Let's just keep going. So. You know, it wasn't like I never asked myself that question because I think any anybody would and does in show business, uh, but you know, it 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 continued. So yeah. <laughs> I guess yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. Like, that's about the best I can sum it up. It's almost an ethereal thing, but you feel it. You know? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I was uh, so I did another podcast earlier this morning with uh, with Iman. He's uh, he's an actor. He used to be in a like a, an Egyptian metal band. Yeah. He moved to a uh, and yeah, he, cool. And he was he was, he was like he, he sort of had like an easy like an easier run compared to and he was like it was it was simple mm-hmm. in a sense that it was a passion, you know what I mean? I, I'm paraphrasing yeah, yes. here where it's like a lot of people move to Hollywood thinking I'm going to make some money mm-hmm. and I'm going to be huge and 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 he's like it's just not the case and he's like as yeah. soon as you you apply this this uh, real like real world uh, where you get a job make money sense to an exactly. art form. It it loses mm-hmm. a it, it loses its taste a little bit. So you you instead of yeah. trying to do what you think is like pure and in terms of artists, like I used to be a guitarist, uh, so I understand art yeah. where it's like you don't want to put you shit out yeah. ju- just for other people. You you want to put stuff that you pour your heart and your soul mm-hmm. into, and and if people enjoy it, it's yeah. a fucking bonus. The the day that you go, yeah, I need to start doing this to do you know to create wealth or whatever. It really sucks all that that passion and drive and the artistic it, uh, it vision can. right I out of it. I think you have to learn how to monetize your gifts, especially oh, definitely, when you're definitely, yeah. in the arts of any kind. You have to learn how to monetize it yeah. because we want to live. We want to live well, and the better we're living and the more money we have, the more we can amplify what we do and the more 
we can create. So yeah. I make no qualms about wanting to make oh. a, 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 few, a few bucks. And I, and I know you don't, and I know that's not your point either, but yeah. I'm just saying it, it, that's something we got to learn and pick up because we get in to make art and it Sorry. is, it's, it's, it, it, it's, as far as it being a passion, that part is easy. And that's what drives it. Yeah. The passion part is easy. It's easy to feel it and own that and, and be with that. Yeah. It's, it's the other extraneous things that can get difficult, you know, and, and then how you, how are you judging your success? I mean, you That's have to thing. judge it on its own merits and on your own and on your success. Are you progressing? Are you doing something new? Are you doing something different? You know, and then how you're monetizing or how large your audience is, is, is another part of that. It's another metric of success, but I don't think it can be the only metric of success. Yeah. That's, you know, you know, that's, a, yeah. that's an excellent way to sort of just polish off what I was saying. That's, that's exactly right. It's uh where, are yeah. you, what, are you, what are you, how are you measuring your success and, and, and then what are you putting more emphasis on? Um, well, yeah. Cause I think if we measured it in terms of that, a lot of us would have gotten out uh, years ago. So you know? We wouldn't have even started. <laughs> yeah. One day on the exactly. job and then you'd be out of it. You know, fucking. Oh, yeah, exactly. You're like, oh, this, I got how much for that gig? Oh, I'm out of here. Yeah, that's you know? Nothing. Cool. All right. Excellent. <laughs> um, when did you know you, <laughs> you, you, you kind of made it? Like, when, was it your first, like, TV huh? appearance? When it, or, when, like, was it your first, like, major gig where there was, you know, like 100, 200? When was it? When was that moment in your head where you, like, you know what I mean? I can do this as yeah. a job. Well, for... There's been markers along the way. I mean, I, I feel like the career has had my career anyway, has had kind of like phases and every phase of it was kind of a new success because I have kind of moved through different things in my career. It's like when I was really young, starting at like 16, I created my own stage show and started putting some bigger things, some illusions and things and created a show that you could do. Uh, on a, on a stage. And, and I did that for, for like, you know, the first eight years I did that at local theaters and things like that. While I was doing smaller gigs to, you know, they paid the bills and parties and things like that. I was still create, I was already creating what I call Fitzgerald's realm of magic and which was my big show, which became kind of the, the flagship of all of it. And, and so I was doing that really young, but when I started, like I said, that was still in the days when it was birds and bunnies and traditional magic and stuff like that. And then it, then it started to transition into the, the cooler, creepier stuff. Uh, and as I did that, as about the time I was doing that, I got hired um, by a guy named Paul Osborne, who worked with David Copperfield and published Delusion Plans and, and also you know, produced a lot of shows. He worked with about all of the major illusionists that, you know, that have been in Vegas or on television, things like that. But he also produced amusement park shows, theme park shows. And I wouldn't work for him for five years in theme parks because I love working with him. And I, you know, he saw what I had created on my own in the show and he knew I could handle an illusion show. But in addition to that, I'd also got, you know, uh, experience on, on managing a show because I, I not only, you know, manage my show, but I managed, uh, you know, a cast and a crew of like five other shows and my own in these parks. So it was a kind of a crash course in kind of a management course of, you know, in stage production and then, you know, dealing with the client park and then dealing with the producer, which was Paul. So I learned a lot there and that was kind of, it was a, it was a great time. I loved it. It was in the late eighties. It was an awesome time. It was a great time to be out there and it was just an awesome time to be alive and having a great time because the, you know, it was a good time. And I was still really, really young because they hire young people for those gigs because they don't have to pay them a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's exactly so, right. But I learned, I learned a crap ton and I got to, you know, I wound up, you know, it was a long relationship with Paul and everything. Sadly, he passed in 2016, but, you know, he had put out a couple of books and he put, he put out uh, illusion plans regularly. And people will know him from that if they know the magic industry at all. And uh, he's, he had two books of spooky magic. One was called Haunted Illusions. I've got a nice feature in that. And then the last one he did called Evil Illusions, I actually wrote the foreword to. He tapped me to write the foreword to the book, which was a huge compliment for me. So that's one of those markers where you know you're kind of on, you know? And I felt like when I was working for him in the parks that that was, that was a, a, a measure of success. It was a lot of good work. I learned a lot of things. I got to work with good people. And I met lifelong friends. And, and I made some money. But it was also seasonal work. So you're working a little better than half the year, the summers. 
in that gig and the rest of it, then you're booking your own stuff. So after that, as soon as that was over, I started, you know, it's like the hair was blonder, the look was changed and it had started to get, you know, uh, you know, the, the more of the velvet vampire look kind of yeah. thing. Cause that was happening. It was influenced a lot by the goth industrial subculture, you know, that actually started back in the seventies, but then went up through the eighties and everything. And, and I was, you know, I was there as that was forming and changing and everything. And, and at first it was very velvet vampire kind of, the, kind of, you know, somewhere between the, the look during the cable show, which was in the early nineties, was kind of like somewhere between uh, Bowie's Goblin King and the vampire stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. Right in the middle. Uh, if you want to see any of that, it's on my YouTube channel and, and, and you know, there's a whole playlist of some of my old uh, cable TV. Yeah, I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna keep looking through it tonight. I uh, I had a, I had good fun last night. Like I said, I was up. Uh, I, was, yeah. I think I was like four or five hours into it and just. Well, thanks for checking it. that out. And they are fun. I mean, they were fun, and there was good music in it and everything. I mean, and at the time, I had I had pitched it to MTV, and and then the, sadly they passed on it because I thought the music's right for them, and they were doing a lot of alternative music, and yeah. if they're gonna have Tom Green sucking on the teat oh, of a goat, Jesus I'm Jesus. way more entertaining than that. 100%. So. Uh, and, but I don't know, but it, it did not, um, I got to pitch them, but it didn't, it didn't sell. They didn't buy it. So I just kept doing it on my own, but it was in that time, like really early into the, the kind of the, what I called next, the cable show era. And that, um, I did the magic castle. I performed at the magic castle kind of Mecca for a lot of magicians in LA and Hollywood. Yeah. And that was another marker where I knew I was kind of on the right path when I got to do that. And that was tough to book because I was so different too. They, you know, they, they're, they're all about magic, but they, 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 you know, if you're doing something different, they're not that supportive of yeah. it, honestly. They just put the, the card yeah. tricks and the, and the bunnies out of the hats. That's for the, they, they like traditional and they like slightly more different than the last guy. Yeah. But when you come out and you're, you know, I'm sticking needles in a girl's neck and all this stuff I doing a vampire that. piece. Was and, and all the magicians loved it. They're like, you got to go see the freak upstairs. Who's like poking girls with a needle and all this weird stuff. Yeah. And they, and it, it was fun and it's vampire and it's all of that. And, um, the guy that booked me there, the guy that, that, uh, Bill Larson, that, that owned ran the castle just didn't get it, you know, yeah. and didn't particularly like me. I didn't think either because he was very old school and traditional magic. And it just wasn't what he was about. But there are so many of the people in the castle that flocked to the show because it was something different, finally, that they got to see in there. So I, I felt like it was a win, you know? I'd count uh, it as a win. And it, was, and, I, it, and it looks great in the resume. I never went and did it again because I was like, okay, been there, done that, what's next? That's right. And, and I also got to do Lollapalooza. So I'm the only illusionist to ever play the second stage on Lollapalooza. What was that like? Uh, uh, it was crazy. It was, it was, uh, you know, they offered me the whole tour and then they offered me the Eastern leg of the tour and then they offered me the Midwest and it wound up being just like, you know, a couple of dates in the Midwest, you know? So it, it wasn't everything that they, they promised at first, but it was fun to do it. I mean, I'm on stage, I'm closing the second stage of Lollapalooza and I can hear Soundgarden in the backstage on the main stage. That's trippy. That's like, that was really fun and cool. I drew a big crowd, but when I got there, it was really doing. It was hard. It was sold out. It was super hot. Yeah. You're outside, which I was used to because of the amusement park work and stuff. And, uh, uh they ran out of water. They, they literally ran out of bottled water and water for people. So the crowd is overpacked. They're hot. They're unhappy because they're running out of stuff. Um, and, and then they were like moving me around at first. They're like, Oh no, we want you on this stage or we want you on this stage. or we're going to put you in this field. And I'm like, no, I want to do what I came here to do. You said second stage. I'm here for second stage. Put me on the second stage. And we got to do that. Yeah. But it was yeah. honestly to do it was very cool in the end. And it's a great credit, but it was like the worst of a nightclub show and the worst of a, an, an amusement park, theme park show all jammed into one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So some of it was very hellish, um, but it was it was an amazingly weird, cool time to be up there, like you know, setting somebody on fire in a coffin and, and Lollapalooza on the big old second stage while you hear Soundgarden playing live in the background. That's just trippy and cool and fun, you know. 
So definitely, so it, was, a... it was a low. It was tough to do, but I was really glad I did. It's it's one of those gigs that you'd ne- like nobody would turn down. It's you know what I mean. No, you wouldn't. You'd be no. like, no. I mean, again, it's yes, like, and, and it was, this was at the time because you know they you know MTV had put a call out and said you know this is because this is before they settled on Lollapalooza, which is every year in Chicago now. They were still touring at that time. Yeah, and uh, and so MTV MTV put a call out for weird and unusual and variety entertainment, and I'm like, well, that's me. And I got in, they, they liked me and they put me on, but it, and then because it was run by some, you know, woman that runs clubs in LA, it was not terribly well run. You know, they weren't organized and it wasn't all her fault either. I mean, in her defense, she, it was, she was doing to do what they hired her to do, but then the larger Mm -hmm. part of Lollapalooza, which is mainly concerned with big bands and a big audience didn't really care about what she was doing. So there was a miscommunication and one hand didn't know what the other hand was doing. And that's what made it really hard for us, the entertainers they hired to go do that, especially, I mean, and I suppose if you're just going on there and doing fire reading or some sort of, you know, who dance act or, or whatever, whatever act you might have, but if it's smaller and stripped down, that's one thing. But when I'm rolling up with a van full of illusions and, and a cast and everything, yeah. I, you know, I don't want to get jerked around. I want to go do the goddamn, I want to go set it up and do the damn show. You know, I don't want to start talking about, you know, where we're going to perform or what's going to go on when it was, this was all settled. Doing it that, in the that field. was the thing. It was a moving target. They kept changing things as we kept going. Along. Yeah, fuck that. I, I would be like, imagine if it was like a band and they rock up and they're like, "Oh, we're gonna have you on second stage." You're like, yeah, okay. I like, know we're gonna have you out in this field now. Yeah, you'd be like, "Fuck off." <laughs> like, it is, well, yeah, exactly. And, <laughs> and, and most way. of those bands would have just picked up and left. Let's catch but, you later. Yeah, you know, that's I right. knew enough to negotiate and and just stick with it for a little bit. I'm like, I look, I'm all the way out here. Let's just do what we said we were gonna do. Yeah, and then we eventually did that. You know? Yeah, what an experience. Also, you know, what an experience. Yeah. I think I, if you it walk was, away with it, anything. It was an amazing experience. It makes for a great story now. 100%. It, it, was, it was really fun doing the show. Yeah. It was really hard getting to it. And I, I didn't appreciate that they made it so hard to get to because you know they do that to all the smaller bands there too. Oh, if yeah. you're not a big name band with radio play, they were getting the same treatment that I was. So I guess it was a badge of honor in that, in that way. Uh, you know, and that and just being there. But, you know, I'm like, you know, you could treat everybody else a little better. You know, you could be oh, a, little, yeah. a little better to them. I know they're not the main draw. We're not, we're not, you know, the main thing on the menu. But still, you know, we're here adding to the experience. Just, just be nice. Just play nice. I that's think that's, uh, yeah, that's right. I think it's a thing that's across the board, though. Even in Australia. Australia's, uh, Australia's lost yeah. most of their major festivals for dumb shit like that, where it's like people like that. Really? Yeah. 100%. We lost so many in like the space of like five, the big ones, like Big Day Outs, all of our dance festivals. Really? So many. Yeah. Just because, same thing, you'd go there, there'd be no water, there'd be no shade, there'd be, you know, uh, and it's Bands. brutal in the heat for that audience. Oh, yeah. 100%. And they put 100,000, yeah. 200,000 people, whatever it is, into yeah. a, a fucking small space, and, you know, people passing out. And then you mix drugs and alcohol into it. And Well, yeah. exactly. You know, and, and especially if you're out there drinking, yeah. you know, you know you're going to dehydrate. And if you run out of water, that is an issue. Yeah, you know? that's right. And uh, But they don't give a shit. They, uh, they make their no. money. They look at, like you said, they... <laughs> They always looked out to big bands and the, the lineup would change like days out because they're not fucking paying anybody. It's a, it's a fairly universal yeah. thing. And uh, fuck you guys. Yeah. <laughs> it was ruined it's festivals. Like, have, you ever, have you ever seen the fuck documentary you. on Netflix about the fire Festival? Some exactly. of it just runs like that. And exactly. It's just, like, ah, it's, just, come on. it's just the other people pull it off a little better than that, that dick bag. Uh, you, you well, I mean? that's yes, for sure, absolutely on that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Some people are far better at it than than others, and not everybody's treating everybody that bad. But it does seem that once they got your money for that ticket, oh, they, they seem to care less about. It. And, uh, that's 100%. not cool. That's so uh, festivals. If you're listening, you know, fuck, fuck you. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Fuck you. <laughs> fuck off. <laughs> give the give people back their shit. Like, like we, like everybody enjoys a festival. Well, and the fact just, that you just live up it. to what you promised us and make it a good experience. You yeah. know, for everybody else doing the show. You know, 
uh, and for the audience, it's exactly. coming up and mm. roasting in the heat for you to see their favorite acts that you promised them. Just deliver. That's all. We're not asking anything extraordinary. Just deliver on what you said you were going to deliver on. It ain't that damn hard. It's pretty simple. Pretty easy. <laughs> um, all right. So Lollapalooza happens. Does that increase? Yeah your notoriety are you start are you finding yourself you're, you're becoming more noticed uh are you on tv more because you start bit. to travel don't you? yeah well it's always been it, it been gains here and i'm doing you know cool stuff and at the time i was also doing a lot of you know haunted attractions uh, throughout a lot of the you know uh you know the haunt industry so you know halloween's always a big season obviously for what i do that's big and you know later i got to do uh, the Hong Kong Halloween festival. I got to go spend a month in Hong Kong and do the show. And that was, you know, that was really cool. I love that. And I love Hong Kong, you know, was it crazy? Um, would you do it? Yeah. So you go yeah, little, it was fun. It, you it put me wild? down there across the, the international date line down there with you guys. So <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, <laughs> I was down here, that's... closest that I got to Australia so far. Um, yeah, and I, and I loved every minute of it. It was very cool. And in fact, one of the guys I worked with there in the shows, everything there, uh, he was an Aussie. He was he was yeah, from there, so it, it was cool. So there was a little bit of everybody from around the world there. Plus, you know, personally, it was just kind of like landing on the planet of hot Asian women, and I was like, oh, I like this here. I'll, I really, I'll stay. This is very nice. This is definitely a perk. I'll stay so, for a, I'll stay for a little longer after the show. I'll do. It. <laughs> I will. I'm, I'll hang. I'll, I'll how hang long out. Run this gig for yeah. because. Halloween in January, I'm fine with that. Let's, yeah, that's right. Let's I'll, uh, yeah. let's 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 start a new <laughs> tradition of a three month long Halloween. So so it was good. So everything you know, things snowballed. It's it's been a snowball effect, and you know, it doesn't make me a household word or anything quite yet. I'm still I'm I've got a lot of like pretty solid cult celebrity, and I'm to the point where I'm I'm really I'm really you know working to leverage that into like a, a bigger project, wh whatever that might be. But but there's so much behind me now. I'm I'm you know started writing a book about the the journey because so many people you know will stop and go oh you should write a book with all those stories and I'm like done yeah you know? why not so, I'd, I'd read it uh, yeah I'm doing that and you know and then I like and I also like acting in, in horror films and stuff. There's so many because of all the streaming services and all the different things now. There's so many there's so many more opportunities for actors, especially in, you know, genre stuff, you know, horror, sci-fi, fantasy, I'm all about that and I'm deep in it already. So those are the kind of things, the kind of castings I like to go out for. Yeah. Um, yeah. I saw this, so I'm uh, thinking I can leverage all the, the cult weird mojo and everything I've learned along the way and the skills I've picked up into, into something more there, you know, and, and if you get, if you land on a big enough show, then that brings in more audience too everything seems to kind of bring in a little more audience the horror stuff brings in audience a little bit on the magic end and stuff like that and and even from the, the music end because he used to tour with a goth band called the dark theater here in the states and things like that so there's there's been little bits here and there and i still have people that years later remember even after i shaved my head and everything they will come up to me all the time if they if they were in the area and they recognize me from the cable tv TV show. I am that? thrilled that people have such a fond memory of that. And that's what inspired me to finally put it up online on my YouTube channel, because I was like, well, you know, everybody really enjoyed that. So it'll be great for them to see it again. And then for all the people that weren't there the first time around, I can now go freak out the entire globe when they, you know, come across my, my cable show. And, and that was a good successful run. It ran 90 through 96. So that was seven years and uh, so, you know, that, you know, I got a little cred here. So it's a little bit here, a little bit there. And as soon as I was done with that, that's when I got offered and started acting in horror films. So then that began, you know, kind of the next phase of the career, I guess I would say. Yeah, and, it's, uh, you know, you're, you're doing it at a perfect time. that got me time. into doing some cool stuff. Yeah, you, uh, sorry, I'm just saying you're doing it at a perfect time. It's uh, um, even with all the stuff that's going on in the world and, and how hard it is for things to, people to do things, we're, we're really solidified in the the era of the internet so it's very easy for to get information out there now it's very easy to exactly. to get a, a little bit more exposure it is a bit oversaturated mm -hmm. but if you have a particular skill set or something that's that stands out a little bit uh it's not hard yes. to, to to pick it up and and get noticed um with national vampire i'm trying to find it i can't find it anywhere 
I was very interested it's in hard it. to find some it ran on cable I think and I've had people come up to me occasionally that say that they've seen it because they say it ran on cable ran on television somewhere here in the states anyway yeah and then then they people come up and said oh yeah I did see you in that vampire documentary so uh so that's cool but yeah I'm not sure where to find it right now um I wish they would put it back I don't know why it's not on a streaming service they could monetize it all over again you know there's a bunch of the movies I did kind of early on that I don't know why there aren't still on, you know, especially if it's a curated, you know, service like one of the horror channels or something like that. It should definitely be there. You well, know? Well, so, yeah, like you know. we don't we don't get fuck all in Australia. We get we get the uh, what really? the leftovers. Oh, we get like I couldn't I couldn't find uh, your other movie on um, uh, Amazon. We just we just don't get certain things. We uh, are. you know, no, I'm sorry about that. I'll, I'll have to make sure I can get it to you. Well, yeah, we'll figure. I might, I might have to get the the old VPN and say I live in. I don't know. Uh, that well, that is the way we're doing. You get like Surfshark or some other VPN, and um, uh, then you can just set it to whatever country you want, and you can go get in somebody else's, you know, video yeah. library. Because we're, so, we're missing, we're missing out on all the all the good stuff here. So with National Vampire, the reason why I keep coming back to this one, it was obviously a documentary. There's Obviously, yes. enough yeah. interest or people wanting to be vampires. Is that correct? Yes. I, I give good vampires. <laughs> <laughs> so, how, how, did, how did you get involved in, in, in this uh, like bizarre underground world of, of vampires? Like, it was a, they just saw your magic and they're like, that's kind of dark, this is kind of dark, and then they just fit them together? Part of it's the persona, and I mean, like I said, it used to look like it used to be the vampire yeah. stop with the long blonde hair, and then it went very Nosferatu with the shaved head, and I even did a series of photos, uh, Nosferatu photos, with um, famed dark art photographer here in the States, uh, Jim Sorkley, SNS Photo, and I did a whole uh, Nosferatu series of photos with him, which are really great, and you can see some of them on my uh, on my website and on my social and things like that. I'm 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 always floating those through. And a lot of people thought they were they were so good, everybody thought they were movie stills. And that makes me want to make an Osterachi movie. But you know, that's another project for another day. Um, so I got the 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 interesting thing is about that particular project about about um, American, you know, National Vampire, is that it started off uh, when they first brought me into it, it was a gonna be a documentary about Gothic about gothic people about the gothic community and they said that they found so much of the and it runs alongside it's really kind of adjoining but but they're separate but they they run together a lot because of the fashion and a lot of the literature and the things that they jointly love the vampire community and the gothic community cross-pollinate a lot so yeah so that yeah. that bam yeah so that daft documentary that was going to be a, a documentary on gothic because they wanted a gothic illusionist and that's when that's they it. brought me into it and but then they knew I did this vampire stuff, and I, I've always had this persona on online. I mean, I even get emails today on my social media and on my on my uh, website, people asking me to turn them into vampires. I'm like, do you remember reading actor and gothic illusionist anywhere? <laughs> I, you know, and they're asking me to turn them into to turn them to the to the dark side into an actual vampire. And I'm like, well, you know, as much as I'd like to bite you, yeah, that's uh, right. I, I, <laughs> It's like I'll give it a go. Effect. I'll try yes. it, but yeah. I got problems. So, so they, so those things run kind of congruent, kind of side by side. So their goth vampire or their goth documentary transitioned into a vampire documentary because they were finding more, <laughs> more stuff. And I think the things that just appealed to them were more the vampire aspects of goth. So that way, I wind up in you know National Vampire, a vampire documentary. And and I've done several vampire projects since then. I mean, I'm in a, in a, a an ultra no budget movie called uh, you know Dracula's Orgy of the Damned, which sounds like porn, and it would have been more fun if it was. 100. <laughs> it, uh, it sounds very close to porn. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be able to punch it in. I'll put I, it into I mean, my. I was, you know, I'll put it into my computer. My girlfriend well, will come home. He was a nice guy, but it was made for it was made for basically you know pocket change and lint. Yeah, you know, yeah. and it was not. That's it's not, not porn one money. of my best movies. Let's yeah. just say that. I think it's all exposure, uh, right? Like you just oh, yeah. get a it's little. A great over. title, and yeah. I had such high hopes for it. Going, even if this is just a camp fest, this will be great. And yeah. it wasn't. It didn't even make it to that level, which is unfortunate. Um, 
but it's it's it, when I bust out that title for a live audience, they, they I mean, people scream at that. They think it's hysterical, and it is. It but is. I wish I wish the movie was good so I could actually push it more. <laughs> um, so that's that's one of the other vampire things I've done, you know. Um, and and that's that's kind of you know that so that documentary you know National Vampire is kind of off of all it treads off of all of that. It's like even when I was out with the goth band, the Dark Theater. The leader of that band uh, went by Vlad, you know, Scott Vladimir Lysina. And, and so it was Vlad. And he'd been on Ricky Lake and a bunch of, like, daytime TV and everything. Because they, they didn't give a damn about his music, but they loved the fact that he billed himself as a blood drinker. And that was controversial enough for them to start putting him on all, all of the, the salacious daytime TV shows. Yeah. So – yeah, I, I, and we we were together. I was featured on on Fox in um, the Fox Network in in uh, in the states anyway. Had a show. I don't know if you remember. I don't know if it went ran there as well. Called Sightings, which was all about weird, you know, unusual stuff and vampires and UFOs and Bigfoot. That kind of that kind of. I think we had something topics. something similar. Um, it might have been under a different title and even in the same show, but a different title yeah. in, in different countries because it seemed like something they would syndicate, you know, and run concurrently in, in different different uh, venues. But uh, I was on that with him. You know, he was on there, and then they brought us in, and that was all about vampires. So I started to get a lot of vampire cred, you know, by touring and, and associating with the band and doing things with the band and the other things that I did. And, you know, and just one of the, those key effects, like I was talking about, that goes all the way back to me performing it at the Magic Castle and even before that is that what I call the Vampire's Kiss, which is a 12-inch long surgical grade stainless steel needle that I stick into the flesh of my, you know, lovely companion's neck and and it wiggles around and it looks completely real. It is an illusion, yeah. but it looks so real. And I mean, you could be right, I mean, just a couple of feet from it and swear you're seeing the real thing. And then you pull that needle out, and I'm licking the blood off the needle, and there's blood coming out with the two puncture wounds, yeah. which looks like a vampire bite, you know? It and, does look you know, very wearing, real. Huh? It does look very real. <laughs> I watched it on, yes, the, on, the, on it, YouTube awesome. last night, and I was like, yeah, oh. Wait till you see it. The version of that in Dark Realm will spin your head off. It's really, It really looks amazing in, in the movie, and, and, it's, and it's the most provocative way I've – presented it so far it, it's very like i say it's it, it, there's part of dark realm it, it's it's really it's art house for it because it's kind of like it's it's it, it is live performance it's a horror narrative horror story and it's kind of an art film too in places yeah and yeah. that's one of those places where i made some choices where it, it's it's in a way where i could not always do it live because of the way venues are regulated i mean you know um she's topless in this and it is provocative and it's a kind of it's a kind of of thing you would see in some sort of unregulated out of the way fetish vampire night in 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 a, in a, in a nightclub mm. because that <laughs> that large scene that 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 contains that and some other things um and my lovely friend sherry jubilee who's one of my one of my castmates and that and she's like naked and stable parts of herself doing a stable guy Oh. And so I take you, I take you into the world of of kind of you know, goth and burlesque and fetishism because that's where I spent a, a good amount of my career in the '90s as well was working in clubs and those clubs were all these cool, dark, little secretive kind of night spots and goth clubs and things and and so there's there's a bit of that in dark room too. But that through that that's that that also again that kind of like almost secret society thing pushes that vampire angle with the audience and uh, with me, you know? Yeah. That's sounds like uh, of that. And the reason yeah. I think that sticks with me. So just because of my look too. I mean, you know, I, I think, you know, that's why people gravitate and they see some vampire stuff on my page and I can say actor and Gothic illusionist and creator of dark sticky fun all day long. And they're still going, make me a vampire. I mean, that just says to me that the look, <laughs> the look clearly works. So you pulled it off. Yeah, uh, I mean, it, it, I think it's I think it's so much about that and the attitude of things as anything that you know the whole you know the wardrobe and everything else. It's just it's the look and the attitude. But there is just something that na the audience naturally gravitates to me and, and associates me with the world of, of vampires and stuff. So hey, 
If it works, it works, you know? Uh, I, well, you know, it's one of those things I always loved. So I, I was like, clearly I promoted it because I put a vampire piece in the show. And, and there's been some other very vampire pieces in the show. But certainly the Vampire's Kiss being at the top of that list. And since I, that has been part of the show for so long, you know, it, it, that's part, uh, I guess, of my cred, of the reputation that people that kind of know me in a cult way know about that. And, and in fact, that illusion actually made its way in, into one of the horror films I made with uh, writer-director John Lachago in Hollywood. Uh, there's a movie called Blood Gnome, which you would also like quite a bit if you can find Blood Gnome. It was streaming for a while, and this is a couple years ago, on Netflix in the States. I don't know if it's popped up streaming in, in any other territories. I'll have um, a look. Or on any other platforms at this point. It might be on another platform, but Blood Gnome's another another really good one, and I do a version of the Vampire's Kiss in that with these uh, burlesque dancers, the Porcelain Twins, one of them. Julie Strain's in it, and, and sadly, uh, sadly, uh, 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 you know, a, a quick word, Julie, we lost her recently. Um, she had passed, but um, she was awesome to work with. So, uh, you know, eternal love out to, uh, out to Julie, wherever you're at now, love. Um, she Love was awesome, Julie. and she was very gracious to work with and very nice. And she was another big cult figure. So I was loving being in that movie and in Magus. With, she was in both of those with us because John liked to work with uh, Julie. And, uh, and, and so, so anyway, we're in this, this movie. And that gets into fetish, too, because Blood Gnome is a movie about little blood-drinking gnomes that are set, and it's set in the world of the underground of the uh, BDSM community. So if you want a reason for your salacious nudity, there you go. There it is. That's the one. There um, it is. <laughs> Ron, I, uh, I love this. Yeah. I got to I gotta go. I, gotta, I, own a, I own a small business and I got a, a rep here. He's, he's here early. I'm so sorry. I, I could have done this literally for Bring hours. Him on. Let's talk to him. <laughs> uh, I won't have a rep anymore. Um, let's, uh, oh. let's do this again. 100%. I got, I got so many more questions hey, I, I want to ask you. you I'm, I'm thrilled. I, I'm, you're, you're, you're my, I was telling you this, you know, in kind of the pre-interview. Uh, you're the first media I've done in Australia and, and my long career. So thank you for that. Thank for all of you for watching. Continue to follow Josh and all the cool things he brings to you on here. So follow him on social and make sure you're, you know, getting notifications on the podcast. And, uh, and then, yes, Josh, absolutely. Thank you. It's been a pleasure and thank you for bringing me on and chatting for a while. I'm sorry you got to run. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. We'll probably be on here Tuesday. So it's. <laughs> that's right. That's right. All righty, Ron. Um, thank you once again. Uh, on my end, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to post all your all your stuff. Uh, so if you can just email it to me, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to post it Don't all. I'll, I'll send you links in the bio and any photos you want or anything like that. I'll I'll send you stuff and then and then uh, you, if you share that with everybody watching that that would be awesome i eternally grateful thank you all right no worries uh ron i'll i'll, I'll be in touch anyway we're going to do this again in maybe a month's time i think and uh, uh whatever you want there's plenty more to talk about <laughs> i i guarantee it i got a million other questions all righty um dude thank you yeah well write them all down save them and then we will do that on part two when we get around to it 100 cool? right. I'm, I'm i'm totally in on coming back all right love it ron thank you so much man have a have Got a great it. day thank, and i'll talk you. to you soon cheers yes thank bye. you bye everyone bye bye